Hello, welcome to another study on the book of Proverbs. We're going to be in Proverbs 22 today, and we'll notice a shift in this chapter. If you had to outline the entire book of Proverbs, most scholars would say chapters 1 through 9 are the call of wisdom and folly. Wisdom calls out to us. It shouts in the street. It tries to attract us and say, come and follow me. Folly does the same thing. And some people follow folly. But if we are fearful of God and want to do what's right, we will pursue wisdom. And so that's chapters 1 through 9. And then beginning in chapter 10, going all the way through chapter 22, verse 16, are a collection of Proverbs. And so here you notice that we are in chapter 22. So in the middle of the chapter, there'll be a shift. And then beginning in verse 17 are a series of admonitions to follow wisdom. And this will continue through chapter 25. And so we'll notice this subtle shift. So chapter 1, or chapter uh, Verse 1 of chapter 22. A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. A good name. Literally, it says name. If you notice the good is in italicized, it's just a name is more to be desired. But it has that same, it has that same uh, meaning in the Hebrew. Uh, we would say in the English, you know, he made a good name for himself. What we're talking about here is a reputation. Having a good reputation, he says, is more valuable than gold or silver. More valuable than riches. If you have to choose between having a good name, having a good reputation and riches, he says, take the good name. Uh, you know, I think we are in a generation that doesn't, believe that it matters what anybody thinks as long as we're benefited from what action we're taking. But it is possible to grow in favor with God and with man. And so that's what he's saying. It is possible to have a good reputation, to be somebody who is solid and outstanding. Now, verses 2 through 16, some folks will say is a definition of what it means to have a good name. And they might be right. For instance, he says in verse 2, The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. And so the guy with a good reputation, he would have, be a person of equity. He would see everybody alike. Uh, you know, it's not a sin to be poor. To be a Christian, you don't have to be rich. You can be rich or poor. Economic status doesn't matter nor does color, nationality, or anything else. God made everyone. Uh, he didn't make us rich, and he didn't make us poor. Some say that, you know, the, the rich and the poor have a common bond, and God made them all. He, got, he made people poor, and he made people rich. That's what he's talking about. He's just saying that everybody, no matter what their economic status is, are people of value. They are made in the image of God. Racism is on the forefront today, and uh, a lot of people are looking at that. And there's nothing more anti-Christian than racism. Uh, racism is, is comes out of the idea of evolution, that some are more advanced than others. And so we should look down on those who are not advanced as much as us. And that is so anti-Christian, because the Bible teaches that from one blood, God made every nation. That's Acts 17. Uh, from one blood, we all bleed the same. Uh, color is just a matter of pigmentation in the skin. God made us all in his image. And the person who has a good reputation recognizes that, he says. Verse 3, the prudent sees the evil and hides himself. But the naive go on and are punished for it. The person with a good reputation steers clear of all evil. He has good judgment. He has good sense. 
Some seem to just run into evil. They just run for trouble. They see a calamity going on. They run headlong right into it. But wisdom clearly sees the end of this path that you're going on. What's going to be the result of this action you're about to take? And the person of a good reputation, he's prudent, he sees evil, he hides himself. But the naive goes on and are punished for it. Verse 4, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Uh, the person of a good reputation has humility. Jesus said in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and uh, there are so many passages we can go through week after week because he continually talks about humility. But Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 12, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Solomon said that right here. The one who humbles himself he will be rewarded. Uh, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Uh, too much arrogance today. What I see all around me, a lot of arrogance, too much blame, too much judgment, too much hypocrisy. Be humble and respect others. And he says, you will be rewarded for that. Verse five, thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards himself will be far from them. Uh, the guy who has good reputation is mindful of the dangers of life. He sees them as thorns and snares, the uh, hindrances, the traps of life. He sees those things and he guards himself and takes himself away from those things. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards himself will be far from from them. Those who are perverted, those who are perverse, they find constant hindrances. They find constant traps. They find constant problems. Uh, be wise enough to understand where these pitfalls of life are and you will have a good reputation. Verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Uh, train up a child in the way he should go. The way, uh, the bent that he is on, uh, the way he is inclined to go. In fact, in chapter 30 uh, of Proverbs, beginning in verse 18, it gives us an insight into the way. Uh, chapter 30, verse 18 there are three things that are too wonderful for me, four things I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done no wrong. These things he says, are just amazing to me. They're just so wonderful. I can't hardly understand. They're just so smooth. They just, it's so natural. And there's a bit. There are some things that just come natural to certain children. Some children are going to be very athletic. Some are going to be very artistic. Some are going to be very intellectual. Don't stick a round peg into a square hole. He says, find out what your children are like and then train them. You have to train them. Train them in the way they should go. The, the, you know, not in the way that you wish you had gone, but you didn't, but the way they should go. Train them. You know, we say practice makes perfect. But there's another corollary statement to that, and that is that practice makes permanent. <laughs> you know, some people who've been in the military will talk about all the training they did with their weapon and how they could take apart their weapon and put it back together. And they did that over and over so they could do it blindfold, that they could do it in the dark in case they were on the battlefield and had to do it. And what they'll tell you now 30 years later is that they could still do it. <laughs> because not only did practice make perfect, it made it permanent. It, it just is in their mind, they can't get rid of it. You can remember things you did over and over and over as a kid maybe. You could still do them today. And the way he should go uh, not in the way of rebellion or perversion or the way of evil, but the way that he should go. You have to be mindful of what he said in verse 5. 
Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards himself will be far from them. There are snares and, and hindrances. There are, are there, there's a perverse way that a child might want to go. He also says in verse 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Not in the way the child wants to go, but in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, some people use this as the impossibility of apostasy. Uh, your child falls away. Oh, don't worry. The Bible says that even if they depart, they'll come back to it. There'll be come some time when they'll come back. Well, they might come back, but they might not, because that's not what this is teaching. It's teaching us to look at our children and understand their talent, their individual talent, their inclination, their bent, and try to help them develop that inclination. All right. Verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrow, borrower becomes the lender's slave. The uh, person who has a good reputation is responsible for their finances. Here it says that the borrower becomes the lender's slave. I, I think we should remember that every time we get a, out a credit card and want to use that. Because once you put something on credit, now you're under obligation. And they make money by charging interest. So now you're under obligation to pay them back what you borrow with interest. And you are working for them to pay off this debt. Now, when Solomon wrote this in the Old Testament days... Those people who went under, into great debt literally could sell themselves as slaves. In fact, most of the time when you read about slavery in the Old Testament, we're talking about a debtor slave. They can't do anything else to pay back their debt other than to sell themselves to a rich person who will pay off that debt, will redeem that debt and buy that person, and he will work off that debt, and on the seventh year he'll be released and so that's what it's talking about. So he just says, be careful to know that the rich will rule over the poor and the lender becomes the borrower's slave. Verse eight, he who sows iniquity will reap vanity and the rod of his fury will perish. Uh, the guy who has a good reputation desires to sow good seed for God. There is a law of reproduction, and that is you will reap what you sow. And this is a law. If you sow corn, you're going to reap corn. You sow watermelon, you're going to reap watermelon. Whatever you sow, that is what you're going to reap. And this law comes into our life as well. If you sow evil things, you'll reap evil. If you sow spiritual things, you'll reap spiritual things. And that's what he's talking about here. Uh, this law of reproduction. Those who, he says, sows iniquity, they reap vanity. Now, the idea of vanity here is the idea of nothing. <laughs> they have an emptiness. You sow iniquity, you sow sin, and you're going to feel empty inside at the end, you will realize that you have nothing. There is an emptiness. So to the flesh, and from the flesh you'll reap corruption. So to the spirit, and you'll reap from the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what this guy gets. Verse 9. He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor. So the guy of a good reputation is a generous person and he gives even to the poor. Verse 10, drive out the scoffer and contention will go out. Even strife and dishonor will cease. The person with a good reputation has a pure heart and he is trustworthy. The scoffer, the scorner, he talks about the scoffer quite a bit. This person is disrespectful, he's cynical, He's irreverent towards God and morality. And the big issue is here he causes strife. He causes discord. And Solomon says, drive him out. And this strife and this discord will cease. The problem we have today is we see this guy everywhere. You 
go into Facebook or Twitter or any kind of social media, and this guy is everywhere, this scorner stirring up trouble. He's on the left, he's on the right, he's in the middle, politically he's everywhere, he's on TV, he's on the radio, he's everywhere. This guy who's constantly stirring up trouble and strife. Too much of today's news is scoffing. Too much of politics today is scoffing. And it leads to argument and strife. And it has just become epidemic. Are you a scoffer? What are you posting on Facebook? Does what you put on Facebook lead to strife and contention and dishonor? Man, if we get rid of you, he says, all this will cease. Be careful. You see, the guy with a good reputation, he has a pure heart, and he's trustworthy, and he's not stirring up trouble. Verse 11, He who loves purity of heart, and whose speech is gracious, the king is his friend. He's pure in heart, and he is gracious in speech, and he finds favor with everyone. You know, even the king, what the government wants, he says, and what the king desires is to find good and honest people. You are a good and honest person, and you speak the truth. Even the king is going to be your friend. Verse 12, the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but he overthrows the words of the treacherous man. Uh, so the, uh, the guy with the good reputation, he speaks righteously. Uh, God sees him and guards him. And conversely, God destroys. He works against the treacherous. Verse 13, the sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I will be killed in the streets. <laughs> the lazy guy, the like, there's a lion out there. Uh, you think, well, if there's a lion up there, maybe it's a safe thing to not go out. But, you know, when you don't want to go work, any excuse will do. There's no lion in the street. He's just trying to find an excuse. And any excuse will do if you're lazy. That's what Solomon is saying. And, and so, if you want to have a good reputation, you better be a good worker. This is what he's saying here. He is a hardworking person. He's not lazy. Uh, verse 14, the mouth of an adulteress is a deep pit. He who is cursed of the Lord will fall into it. A uh, guy with a good reputation is a guy who is moral in every aspect of his life. This adulteress literally says the strange woman. What's strange about her? She's not your wife. Any woman who is not your wife, he says, stay away from her. Uh, he's cursed of the Lord who falls into her mouth, who listens to her persuasion, who, who begins a relationship with her. You know, there's some things in our life that we can work on. There are certain weaknesses that we need to work on, and, and we work on them. Maybe it's your pride, or, or maybe it's the way you speak, or whatever it is. We, we need to work on that. But God never tells us to work on immorality. What does he say about immorality? Flee from immorality. You don't work on a pornography problem. You flee from it. You don't, you don't work on any aspect of immorality. You flee from it. And that's what Solomon is telling us. Uh, the mouth of an adulteress is a deep pit. You get yourself in some serious trouble fast. And he is cursed of the Lord who will fall into that deep pit. Verse 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Uh, the guy with a good reputation is willing to discipline his child. The rod, he talks about, the rod of discipline. It's not the rod of abuse. It's not the hand. It is the rod of re abuse that will remove foolishness from the child. Sometimes our kids just need that corrective reminder that what they're doing, that their behavior is wrong and they should not repeat what they've been doing under any circumstances. And here's the reminder of that. We shouldn't be abusive. You should never do this in anger. Never swat your kid. Never hit, hit your kid. 
but there is a time when a rod of discipline is necessary. I think too many parents today want to be liked by their child more than they love their child. The person who has a good reputation knows how to discipline his children. In verse 16, he who oppresses the poor to make more for himself or who gives to the rich will only come to poverty. A uh, person of a good reputation is not a self-serving person. He uh, doesn't take advantage of the poor. The poor are frequent victims in the book of Proverbs. And the rich, person gives to the rich. Why would he do that? Well, because he wants something back from them. And, and so the guy who has a good reputation is not selfish or self-serving. So now we, we've seen this guy with a good reputation. In verse 17, we're going to make a shift. There is now going to be an exhortation to heed the words of wisdom. So a little bit of shift in the, in the idea. So verses 17 through 21 go together. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. And apply your mind to my knowledge. For it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, that they may be ready on your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I have taught you today, even you. Have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge to make you know the certainty of the words of truth that you may correctly answer him who sent you? So he began to admonish us why we should listen to him. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. Apply your mind. How do you apply your mind? Well, you meditate on it. You meditate on these things. And there is perhaps nothing harder to do than to do nothing but think. Think, he says. Think about this and apply your mind to my knowledge. For it will be pleasant if you keep them within you. They'll be ready on your lips. They'll be ready on your lips. Uh, how are they ready on your lips? Because you've memorized these things. They are right there. They're ready to come up and you think, oh, wait, I can't do this. I need to, I need to think about this. You, you, you think about the action you're about to take. You think about what you're about to say. You know the importance of wisdom and you know that folly is right there ready to mess your life up. So that, here's the reason. So that, this is what it's all about. So that, this is the end result. So that your trust may be in the Lord. I have taught you today, even you. That's what he wants. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Look at God and recognize that God has the answer for us here. Uh, God has told us that he has given us every way to uh, life and godliness. Now, there are people today who are looking for, for self-help. They're looking for the practical. And there's nothing more practical than God's way. Uh, people want daily help. And that's why self-help books are so popular. That's why counseling is so important. But God has given us everything. Uh, people want the practical, that's what the Bible is. But the problem area is this, that people want what they want, and then they want to find a way to not have a mess out of, because of what doing what they want. How can they successfully live without, uh, how, can they, uh, how can they successfully live while ignoring God? That's what a lot of people want to know. And, What's right and what's wrong in society? Well, that's all over the place. You can go to Facebook and uh, or anywhere. That's a good example. Uh, what is what is right and what's wrong? What's right about sexuality? What's wrong about it? What's right or wrong about crime or drug abuse or racism? I mean, the list is endless. And people using their subjective feelings and emotion are all over. Whatever seems right unto a man <laughs> seems clear and right, but the end is the way of death. What we agree with is what we think is right. And what we don't agree with is what we think is wrong. 
Proverbs is straightforward. Wisdom is straightforward. And Solomon is trying to acknowledge, tell, tell us to follow this because then we will trust in God. Huh. Verse 20, have I not written you excellent things of counsels and knowledge? What, does, what are excellent things? Well, counsel, advice, information, uh, knowledge, a knowledge that he's gained from experience and you can gain from experience. And to make it, you know the certainty of the words of truth that you may correctly answer him who sent you so that you can practice it, you can know it, and because of what it does for your life, you have an answer to anybody who asks you. You say, well, listen, the cops, this has worked for me. Uh, that's what happens when you follow God's word. You prove that it is right and perfect and good. That's what Romans 12 says. Verse 22 and following, Do not rob the poor because he is poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their case and take the life of those who rob them. Taking advantage of the poor. He says at the gate. Now, the gate in the ancient times, that was the court. Uh, legal means to take advantage of the poor. Uh, God says, you don't have to worry about anybody but me. I'm going to take their cause up and you will be crushed. Verse 24, do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourselves. Don't associate it with a man of anger because you're going to lose, uh, learn his ways. Back in chapter 3, verse 31, it says, do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. You see, we pick up the habits of those we associate with. With. And that's why parents tell their kids, you know, bad companions corrupt good morals uh, because we pick up those bad habits. And he said, just don't hang around people who are angry or you're going to find yourself given to anger too. Verse 26, do not be among those who give pledges, among who, those who become guarantors for debts. If you have nothing uh, with which to pay, why should he take your bed from under you? Over and over, Solomon's talked about this, the Dangers of co-signing, being a guarantor for somebody else's debt. Just don't do it, he says. Because the person's not going to go after the debtor because they know he has nothing. They're going to come after you. He says, they'll take your bed. <laughs> well, they've taken all your other furniture already. The bed is, this the representative, this is the last personal thing of yours of value they can take, and they will take even that. Ah, uh, Verse 28, do not move the ancient boundary which your fathers have set. Landmarks are sacred. Uh, they're part of an inheritance. Their fathers had set those, uh, cheating others of their inheritance. He's just talking about uh, land rights here. Verse 29, do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. This is a truth I find. Skilled labor is so respected. Listen, a man skilled in his work. If he's a, a skilled an accountant, if he's a, a skilled teacher, if he's skilled in anyway, if he's a craftsman, if he's a tremendous woodworker, he's going to be honored. Uh, there is nothing better than seeing somebody who is good at what he's doing. Back in the old days, uh, there was a guy in Southern California, Hunt Singer, part of the oil industry, and he had um, he had a, a metal worker shop. You know, he he made t tool uh, drilling tools and stuff, and those workers had to be able to uh, to be able to mill something down within one one thousandth of an inch these guys were the best of the best and if you couldn't get it to be that degree of of exactness then you could not work for this guy well it came out that one of his workers was sick so he went out and hired a doctor and he realized that what he should do is to set up a medical stop, shop right there on the grounds of his big uh, complex and have a doctor because anybody who could mill a piece of metal to within one one millionth uh, one one a millionth of an inch 
deserves the best of medical care. The point of your ears, I always thought that was impressive, but it's what Solomon says. Anybody who's skillful in their work is going to stand before kings. They're going to get the intention of everyone. And uh, if you're not skilled, you know, you're not going to get that. But if you are skilled, you're not going to stand before obscure men. Well, some very practical things, chapter 22. And there's going to be a shift now that we'll see for the next few chapters. But there's still a lot of insights into how to live, how to live righteously before God, how to make a good decision, how to see that the choices we make now will have consequences in the future and how to make a good choice. Well, I'll see you soon. May God bless you.